Okay, um, my name is Paul Younger, um, um, Rank in Chair of Engineering and Professor of Energy Engineering here. Um, I've really enjoyed um, the session so far, and thanks to Malin, everyone who's organised this. It really heartens me to see students doing this sort of thing. Um, we went through many long decades of almost no visible student activism, and it's great to see this sort of thing. Um, so, top marks to all of you for that. Not that this is a graded exercise, of course. <laughs> um, I wish it was in some ways. <laughs> uh, you'd all be getting top marks. Um, but like everyone else, I suppose I should say a little bit about my personal background, where I come from. You can probably tell geographically where I come from, from my accent. And uh, I grew up in a, a shipbuilding and mining community uh, in the northeast of England. And that, for better or worse, has uh, very heavily co coloured my worldview. Um, obviously, I knew and still know, though they don't do it anymore, I know and love a lot of coal miners. Um, although, when I came to live, leave school, um, uh, it was drummed into me that the last thing I should do was go into the pits, not because of climate change, that wasn't known about at the time. Um, but because we could see the writing was on the wall for that particular fossil fuel uh, industry uh, at the time. The irony is that I took my parents' advice and went off to university and learned all sorts of middle class tricks and uh, then ended up working in the, in the mining industry, um, not directly employed in it, I was, I'd become an environmental engineer and what I did was I tried to ensure that the, the precipitate and brutal closure of the, the coal mining industry in the UK um, was managed in a way that didn't completely destroy the environment with acid mine drainage in the process. And that's something I worked on for 20 years. I still dip in and out of it. Um, and I, I learned a lot along the way. Um, so I, I spent about 20 years on that mine water remediation carry on. And one day I woke up and thought, well, I, I've learned quite a lot. I've learned about methane, I've learned about CO2. I've learned how to stop methane being formed amongst other things. Because we didn't want it. Um, and I've learned how to handle methane in dangerous explosive environments underground. I've been in, I've been gassed in the line of duty. Um, all of these sort of things. So uh, I wanted to turn what I'd learned into forward mode and work on energy. So I started that journey about a decade ago. Um, other things I should mention is that when I was a student, I was an activist. Um, very much so. There were different issues at the time. But one of the big ones was the anti-apartheid one. And the investment issue was very much alive then. And I remember different strategies and tactics around that. Like, for instance, at the one hand, pressing for divestment from racist South Africa. On the other hand, the anti-apartheid movement strategically buying just enough shares in various recalcitrant companies that gave them a right to go and speak at the AGM. So they could turn up, just bought enough shares to make an absolute pain in the arse out of yourself. <laughs> um, so you, you, you have to watch quite how far you go with divestment. And, and it does raise a point that Andrew touched on, with the possibility of investor activism. And if the university has got 18 million in some of these companies, um, pressure from the likes of you, perhaps, uh, whatever the outcome, whatever the journey towards divestment, at least as an interim measure, the university may get a bit more vocal in use of whatever rights it's got as a shareholder or a stockholder or whatever it might be to make representation to companies because you know this was what was done in the anti-apartheid thing. Um, I, I never meant to come back into universities actually. I was a volunteer in, in Latin America um, doing village water well projects for some of the poorest people on the planet and that was the work I enjoyed most of my life and I would still be there if it hadn't been for a few complications um, which I'll not bore you with. Um, I never meant to come back to university, but I ended up back in university. And I've always tried to do stuff that was useful, and stuff that I considered ethical. Uh, having said that, um, you know, I, I do work on renewables, but I also work on unconventional gas with carbon capture and storage. Which is a big long mouthful, but I have to say that because I wouldn't want to work on unconventional gas if it wasn't with carbon capture and storage. Okay? If I can't have CCS, I don't want to do it, but what I want to plant in front of you, really, as a professor of energy engineering, is just some of the intricacies of the fossil fuel carry on now. Um, that we've had three excellent expositions, and I didn't find a word to differ with in anything that's been said, really. 
but there's just some of the habits where we talk about things and, and Patrick in his excellent eloquent presentation said when we, you know, about fossil fuels it's, it's not just about how we get about the place and, and power and he mentioned industrial feedstocks but even if we go back to um, the energy side of things for a minute um, what I want to place in front of you is this when we're saying that we don't want gas which is but far and away, in, in my view, the most important and the most useful and the most justifiable fossil fuel because it's got less than half the carbon emissions that coal has, for instance, and getting on for half the carbon emissions that oil has. So, you know, get rid of the long chain aliphatics and aromatics, go down to the lowest number of carbon um, atoms you can have in the compound, methane, it's got one carbon atom per molecule. The others have lots of carbon atoms. So there's a lot to be said for methane. But I'm not going to sit here and extol the virtues of methane, other than it's definitely better than coal. But as I say, if, you know, half the emissions. All I want to place in front of you of this is this, really. That we've constructed an inevitability for the time being, out of which there is no easy engineering fix, where of the gas that comes into the country, uh, let me just wind back a bit so before I go off down the gas thing. Um, when you think of energy, what do you think of? What, what, what image would come into your mind for the energy? Wind, wind turbines, perhaps? Electricity. Electricity. Good man. That's a question I was hoping someone would say. <laughs> and that's all we hear in the press. Electricity. Now, if you know the answer, don't spoil me thunder. You might have been in my lectures and heard this. If you know the answer to this, please don't shout it out. But, um, the, of the energy we use, guess how much is electricity? 20%. So all this fuss we've had out of the Scottish Government and the UK Government about we're going to do this, we're going to do that. These are the targets for electricity, not for energy. 80% of energy is split more or less evenly between transport and heat. In Scotland, actually, it's more like 50% uh, is on heat, 30% uh, is on transport, 20% is on electricity. So I'm actually, I don't care about electricity. Get on with electricity because it's largely irrelevant. <coughs> what I do my research on is how to decarbonize, in particular, heat which in our country is the biggest single use of energy, more than twice the amount of energy that's used as electricity. So that's what I work on. How can we decarbonize heat? And you can't think about heat without getting into gas. So two thirds of the gas used in this country is used in, in people's houses for domestic heating. 82% of households in this country are entirely reliant on gas for space heating, hot water, and cooking. The other 18% are the unlucky ones because they're nearly all in fuel poverty. People who are reliant on fuel oil, it's very expensive. Wood is either for the very rich or the very poor. Um, and a few people have heat pumps. I would love to have a heat pump because I work on them. I would love to have one. Let me tell you why I haven't got one yet. It's mainly because I haven't won the lottery. Um, <laughs> But even if I'd won the lottery, I'd still have to persuade the neighbours that, although I'm an, I'm an expert at drilling, I've done a lot of it, I could probably get a borehole down in two or three days, but I'm afraid I'd have to block the street and uh, ride over the, the curb to drill the boreholes to do it. And my neighbours would have to put up with that while they drill me boreholes. And then, assuming I've got the money, I have to put in a heat pump at a cost of about 8000 on top of the 10 grand I've just spent on the boreholes, and then I find out the heat pump only delivers at 55 degrees centigrade, so the radiators in my house that are expecting about 75, they've all got to be ripped out, and either replaced with super duper brand new state of the art, highly heat exchanging radiators, uh, again at cost of many thousands, or let's go further and rip out all the floors and put in underfloor heating, which would be the best way to deliver it. And I'm sitting here, I'm not whinging about what I'm paid, by the way, but frankly, I can't afford it. The, the, the amount I would ha have to put on my mortgage to do that, what that would increase the monthly outgoings to do, I can't afford it. Now, if I can't afford it, who can? So for the time being, I'll tell you what I'm doing, I'm using a combi boiler. A 
gas boiler. And I'll use it that falls over. Hopefully by then I'll have won the lottery. And when it falls over, and persuade me neighbours to probe a drilling for a couple of days and I'll have a heat pump. But we don't have many alternatives. And this is what I want to place in front of you. Is I absolutely admire and, and align myself with the principles of what you're trying to do. Um, and bringing an urgency to the climate change debate that is absolutely required. But what I don't want us to do is to be vulnerable to the charge that we're ignorant of what constitutes energy. We're ignorant of the degree to which we depend on the very fossil fuels that we're currently appearing to brand as intrinsically evil. Um, and, and, you know, that we've got no idea that energy is mainly about heating and transport and not much about electricity, actually. You know, so I don't want us as a learned institution to do these things in a in a way that leaves us open to the accusation of not having done our homework. So, are, are there alternatives? Are there, is there an easy fix for gas? Well, one suggestion would be biogas, for instance. And biogas is methane. It has a hell of a lot of nitrogen mixed in with it, the way it happens to be produced, uh, which means its calorific value is a lot lower than mineral natural gas. But leaving that aside, we can separate that out. We can put methane in existing gas mains. My problem is feedstock. Let me give you an example. And I know you won't know the answer to this, so anyone can shout out. We've got a sewage works that serves a population of 1.2, this is a real example, a population of 1.2 million people, right? That's a big conurbation. I'll tell you which one it is, Teesside. There's a lot of crap down there. So <laughs> 1.2 million people. One big sewage works. All of the organic matter that's retrieved from the sewage, so in other words, all the crap of 1.2 million people, is anaerobically digested according to the very latest technology. It produces biogas and it produces pasteurized carbon which can be put back into the soil. Great operation, absolutely support it, get on with it, behind it, all the way blogged about it, raved about it, it's a great thing. But let me just ask you this question. Out of the 1.2 million people and their fecal material, how much of their electrical needs is produced by the gas engines that entirely burn every molecule of methane that comes out of that waste? What proportion of that 1.2 million people, how many do you think, does it provide the gas, does that gas provide, you know, part of their electricity? What would you guess? Any guesses? 50, 5 percent. 5 percent? 50,000? What's 50,000? Over 1.2 million. <laughs> can't, can't. Uh, anyway, let's say it's 50,000, let's say it's 5 percent. Um, I can probably do the 5 percent easier, so that's uh, that, that 240,000? Anyway, 200,000, that's it. 50,000, 200,000, something like that. No, it's less than that, sorry. No, it's 100,000. Um, do you know what the real answer is? And I was really disappointed when I heard this. It just about provides 60 to 70 percent of the electricity used by the sewage works itself. Okay? So we've got a problem with feedstock. If that's, if that's the best we can do with biogas, it, it won't cut it. So we've got to have a transformation in how we do heating. And, and I'm sorry to say, if you have, you know, I've already outlined the problems of ground source heat pumps. They're worse with air source heat pumps in Scotland because it's bloody cold in winter, exactly when you want the heat. And you're using air as your heat source. It's a problem. You have very poor coefficients of performance here. It's all right in places with marginal heating needs. Um, solar thermals, good for hot water in summer here, yeah, and a bit at other times of year, but it doesn't even touch heat. So we've got a big problem here. And at the minute, 82% of us are blithely using gas. And, you know, you tell me when you've got, you know, well, work with me to try and find the alternative, is what I would say. And one of the alternatives is likely to be that we, we somehow try to do this with carbon capture and storage. Now, you might say you've lost your mind. You can't do carbon capture and storage on everybody's individual property or the tailpipe of every car which is one of the reasons that we look at electrifying heating to, to try and get over that to some extent. 
but it's a big issue, you know. So all I'm saying is, don't go in without your eyes open. Um, energy is mainly about heat and a fair bit about transport, and it's hardly any about electricity. Um, <coughs> but just to close, really, about the divestment thing. Um, amongst the things I've done in my past, I was a pro vice chancellor for engagement at the University of Newcastle. So I got to sit on um, the university executive board that dealt with these sorts of issues. We dealt with one, which was should the university invest in tobacco, which it used to, and we took the view it's absolutely <coughs> indefensible. There is no upside to tobacco at all. So we divested. You know, we had a medical school. It's, it's a contradiction to invest in tobacco when you've got a medical school. So we divested. Next one up, weapons. I said divest. The right wing people on the executive board said, well, it's possible to conceive of circumstances in which weapons can be used for legitimate defense. I don't agree with them because I'm a bit of a sandal wearing, you know, sort of, you know, peacenik. Um, and when I left that one was still raging. But what will come up with the fossil fuels ones is, is it, the, to my mind at least, they're not intrinsically evil because if we switch off the gas supply to Mrs. McTavish in a, in a high rise block in the east end of Glasgow tomorrow, on the grounds of moral rectitude, Mrs. McTavish is going to die of exposure. Okay, so it's not the same as tobacco. If I stop Mrs. McTavish's supply of tobacco, she might live an extra year or two. But if I switch her heat off, she'll be dead in a fortnight. You know, so it's not intrinsically evil in the same way that tobacco is. And that's not to say I discourage you from campaigning for this. I just want you to go in with your eyes open, and that's all I wanted to say, really. Thank you.